Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you uh, very much for the introduction. So my name is uh, Hugues Dorit Maten. I would like to thank the organizer for um, uh, inviting me here. It's a very, it's a pleasure to be to be here. In this tutorial, um, I will try to explain from a conceptual, but mostly from an experimental point of view, what are the challenges uh, to try to distribute quantum information over very long distance. By very long distance, I mean something on a continental scale. Uh, something within 500, 1,000 kilometers or so. Um, before I start, um, maybe let, let me just introduce a bit more uh, the place where, where I work. So I come from uh, ICFO, the Institute of Photonic Sciences in Barcelona. So this is the city of Barcelona. We are located here, actually about 20 kilometers south of Barcelona. So it's an institute that has been funded in uh, 2002. And basically, it has at the moment about 23 research groups devoted to anything related to the, uh, the, 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 the physics, the, photon the research in, uh, involving light. So for example, we have some research in quantum optics, nanophotonics, nonlinear optics, and, and, and biophotonics. So I'm working, I'm leading the, the quantum photonics group. And in my group, we are basically uh, interested in, in several aspects <coughs> dealing with, with quantum memories, interaction between single photons and, and, and matter. Uh, we are working on, on, on solid state quantum memories. You will hear a bit about this later. Uh, a bit on cold atom quantum memories, um, as well as uh, doing some quantum frequency conversion. Uh, you will also hear a bit about this in quantum light sources. So these are all, let's say, kind of technologies that are needed if you want to, uh, to build a quantum repeater. So I will, I will describe this a bit, uh, a bit more. Okay, so we are interested in long distance quantum communication. So I guess in front of this audience, I don't need to explain in more detail why is it interesting to go to, to distribute quantum information about long distance. We are particularly interested in distributing entanglement over, over long distance. So this could be used of course for quantum key distribution, uh, but also in the future for some uh, quantum networks, for example, or having fun testing, let's say quantum physics over a very large very large scales. So the easiest way to distribute information, quantum information, is to, to use direct transmission in optical fibers. So you have a source, uh, you take your quantum state, you distribute it over, over a long distance. So this is, uh, I think, more or less a state of the art of what can be done in, in that uh, aspect. So recently we had a, 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 a quantum key distribution of about 300 kilometers. That has been done in Geneva. I think we will hear more about this tomorrow and also some kind of entanglement distribution over, over uh, 300 kilometers, uh, an experiment that has been done here in, at the NTT in, in Japan. And so here they have a source and, and, and let's say two 100 and kilome 150 kilometer link to distribute the, the entanglement. But of course this um, cannot be extended uh, much, much longer. So the problem is that the absorption in the optical fibers is exponential. So let's imagine that we have, a, a, let's say, an optimistic case where we have a source that can generate uh, single photons or entangled photons at uh, a, bit, a rate of 10 gigahertz. And then we are looking at the time it takes to, uh, let's say, on average, to, to, uh, to have a click on the other side of the fiber as a function of distance. So up to 500 kilometers, I think we are still more or less okay. It takes something like one second. It's still more or less uh, doable at human scale. If you just now double the distance, takes already uh, quite a bit more time, something like 300 years, which is already not so practical. But if you then go to 2,000 kilometers, you get to something which is very close to the age of the universe. So obviously, it's not a very scalable solution to, to really just try to go on, the, on, on, on this path. So there are um, actually several uh, ways that we can go around, around this. Uh, one is to just uh, forget about fiber transmission and, uh, and go to uh, to distribute quantum information in free space with satellites. I will not speak about, the, about this here. Um, the other one is uh, to, to use quantum repeaters. So this is basically the outline of my, uh, of my talk. I will have an introduction to, 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 to quantum, quantum repeaters. And then I will focus to uh, basically on a type of quantum repeater which is based on, uh, um, sorry, which is based on, on atomic ensemble and, and linear optics. And I will spend some time also to explain 
how we can multiplex these kind of quantum repeaters. And then finally, I will uh, also speak a bit, a bit about uh, how we can build quantum repeaters with single atoms, single emitters, and see what are, what are the, the advantage of this. Okay, so quantum repeaters, it's a solution that has been proposed uh, in, in 98 by Bregel, Dürr, Sirac, and Zoller. And the idea here is we are interested in distributing entanglement, and we basically want to uh, divide the total link, the, the total uh, distance, into several links. So here, for simplicity, I just have, uh, I just have two uh, of these links. And then, basically, we want to distribute entanglement within each of these elementary segments here. So you distribute entanglement here, you distribute entanglement here, and once this is done, uh, you uh, can do some entanglement swapping. So you do a Bell state measurement here in the middle, and this Bell state measurement now will extend the entanglement over, over the, 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 the farthest away um, um, quantum nodes. So for this scheme to work, there are several uh, key aspects that need to be fulfilled. The, the first one is that you, you want to, um, these links to be entangled independently. So what you have to know is that to create entanglement between distant memories, this requires to, to, to send some photons uh, between the two memories, for example, and there will be inevitably some loss in the photon distribution. So the entanglement in the in initial link is necessarily probabilistic. So now if you want to combine many probabilistic processes together and to happen at the same time, uh, this will not be, um, this not be very uh, scalable. So what you, what you can do to make uh, this more scalable is to have a, a quantum memory that is able to store now the quantum entanglement, waiting for the other uh, part of the network to be, to be ready. So what you will do is to try to entangle this one. You try, you try, you try. When you have a success, you stop. You store the entanglement, and you wait for the other link to, uh, to, to be ready. So the quantum memory here use, uh, is used as, as, a, as a kind of uh, way to synchronize now the different parts of, uh, of the network. And the other important thing, which will have uh, actually some, uh, some implications, is that the creation of entanglement in each segment, and also on different swapping, it needs to be heralded. It means that you need to have a, a classical signal that tells you, okay, now your memories, which are far away, are entangled. And this, we will see, will, will have some, uh, some, some implications. So now you can extend this to a bit longer, uh, scale, so for example, like this. Um, you can swap here and, and here, and then you can, uh, you can swap uh, here in the middle. And then finally, you have extended your, your entanglement over, over a very long distance. And we can actually compute now the time it takes, the time required to distribute now an entangled state over, over the, the, the full distance, which is approximated, well approximated by this formula here, where now L0 over C is the, um, L0 is the distance between A and B, for example, and P0 would be the probability to create the entanglement in the first link, in each elementary link. Uh, P1 would be the probability to, create the to have the first entanglement swapping, P2 the second entanglement swapping, and, and, and so on. So depending on how, what we use to do this entanglement swapping, these P's can have different values between, between 0 and 1. If we use linear optics, for example, uh, this P can be a maximum one half, which will be uh, one of the limitations. We can already see here another of the possible limitations is that you have this time, which is L0 over C here, uh, which is basically given by the fact that you need to have this heralding signal telling you when the, 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 the initial uh, links are, are entangled. I will come back to, to this later in more detail to, uh, to see these limitations. Okay, so there are actually um, also other protocols that have been uh, proposed which do not rely on this uh, heralded entanglement here and are not constrained by this, uh, th this communication time, for example. Uh, they also do not rely uh, that much on, on, on quantum memory, so they can relax uh, a lot the, the protocol on quantum memory. On the other hand, they, are, um, they require much more advanced capabilities in terms of interaction between qubits, for example. So I will not talk about this during this talk. Uh, you, but you will hear about it in the next uh, next talk by uh, by Liang Zhang. Okay, so 
we want to distribute now entanglement between remote uh, quantum memories. Uh, so a crucial resource for this is to have entanglement now between the memory itself and, and a photon that you will send far away. So there are basically two ways to, to, to do this. Uh, a first way would have to have what we, what we call a, a, a read-write quantum memory. So it's a quantum memory where we can, you take a quantum state on a photon, you write it in, in the memory, and then you read it out a time, a time later. And then you have a source of entangled photon. One of the photon will be stored in the memory, and the other photon can be sent far away. So this is one way to, to have this entanglement. There is another way, which is actually quite, quite used as well, um, which is what we call to have a, just a read-only memory. So the idea here is to, you have your quantum memory, and you will excite this quantum memory now with a classical laser pulse, and the memory will emit a photon, and this photon will now be entangled with an internal degree of freedom of the memory, for example, uh, a spin degree of freedom or, or, or an atomic excitation, for example. So this first solution has the advantage here that you basically have some wavelength flexibility. For example, you can create with your source, you can create a photon uh, which can be resonant with your favorite quantum memory at any, any wavelength here, and the other photon can be at telecom wavelength to be sent, sent far away. So this is a, a, a nice advantage. This solution, on the other hand, uh, doesn't have this, but the, the advantage here is that you have the memory and the, 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 the source which are embedded in one system. So it's actually uh, more simple to do in, in if you want because you have less, just less elements in your, in, your, uh, in your networks. But the emission typically is not at telecom wavelength, and so you will need, if you want to reach telecom wavelength, which is necessary for, uh, for quantum repeaters, uh, you will need to have some frequency conversion techniques. So I will speak about this also uh, later. Okay, so we want now um, efficient interaction between this quantum memory and, 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 and the photon. And basically, if you just take a single atom and, uh, in free space and, and the photon, the, efficient, the, the interaction is not very efficient. So the interaction, the scattering probability scales of uh, lambda square over A, where A is the area of the beam that you focus on, 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 on the atom. So it's very small under, under let's say, standard, uh, standard conditions. So what has been proposed to overcome this limitation is to take the atom and to embed it into an optical cavity, into a high finesse optical cavity. Uh, this has been pioneered uh, by, uh, by Jeff Kimball at, at Caltech. So here, basically, the scattering probability is enhanced by the fact that you are in the cavity. You know, basically, you can say that the scattering probability is enhanced by the number of bounces that your photon does in, in, the, in the cavity, by the finesse of the cavity. And in that case, one parameter which is very important for this kind of, of, of efficient line butter interface is that what we define as the cooperativity, which is basically the, the atom uh, photon coupling square divided by the, the, the losses. This kappa here is now the line width of the cavity, uh, and the gamma is the line width of the atom inside the cavity. So this cooperativity needs to be very high uh, to have uh, now uh, this efficient interaction that we need and to have, it, for example, efficient collection of the photon that you will, uh, you will uh, uh, collect and, and, and use for, for the network. Um, we don't necessarily, not necessarily need to be in the strong coupling regime, although this, might, this, this helps. Uh, the strong coupling regime would be when now both of these parameters are, are smaller than the, than, than the G. So this is actually a very nice system. Uh, it's a kind of ideal, uh, conceptually ideal system. Uh, but it's actually very difficult to, to implement uh, in the lab. Uh, so there is uh, not many groups in the world that are able to really reach this regime where we can have a single atom trapped in a high finesse cavity in this regime of, of, of high, high cooperativity. So there is another way of trying to increase now the interaction between these, uh, these two systems, between the single photon and, and the matter. And this other way is uh, to have an ensemble of atoms. So now the cooperativity here is um, enhanced by the fact that you have many atoms. If you have an ensemble, it's, it's much easier to interact with light. Uh, for example, you, 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 you can easily, very easily absorb light. Uh, in the atomic ensemble can have high optical depth. And basically we will have typically atoms like this. Uh, this is something that you will, you will see a lot. 
uh, where we have um, a couple of um, spin states, metastable spin states that will be used, that are long lived, that will be used to store the quantum information. And you have an optical transition here that, that we can use to, uh, to, add, to interact between the photon and, and the, the, the atoms. So here the nice point is that you can have strong coupling between the light and, and the photon without uh, high fin cavities. So this is a very nice advantage. Uh, it's much easier to, to do in, in, in practice. And the coupling scales now at, at, at g times the square root of the number of atoms. Um, the way now we can encode qubits uh, in these atomic ensembles, they are encoded in what we call uh, collective atomic excitations. So this is an object like this, where, for example, you would have all the atoms, uh, let's say at the beginning, all the atoms are in, in, in the state G here. You come with a single photon. And after the absorption of the single photon, you have all the atoms in G, but you have only one which is excited. But you, don't, you, you have, in principle, no way to know which atom is excited. So what we have to do is we have, at the end, this kind of uh, large entangled state that we call a collective excitation. And this state is actually very nice because what we can do, uh, I will also come back to this in more detail later, is to um, now have a very efficient retrieval of this, of this information stored as, as collective excitation onto a single photon. So I will explain this a bit in more detail later. And the last advantage of, of atomic ensembles, uh, which will be something very important, uh, as you will see for, uh, for quantum repeaters, is that since you have many atoms, you can, in principle, also store many qubits and have many modes, at least, where you can store uh, a qubit. So you can use atomic ensemble to do some multiplexing, uh, multiplex quantum memories. Um, so there are basically two systems that have been considered so far as, as, um, as ensemble-based quantum memories. Uh, one is um, some laser-cooled atoms, so you take a, a, a gas of rubidium or, or cesium atom, for example, that you cool down in a magneto-optical trap. Um, so typically you have a, a, a gas in a, in a high vacuum chamber and you have six laser beams in the, in the three direction of, of, of space like this to, to cool down and you have a magnetic field gradient to trap the atom at the center of, uh, of the trap. You can see here a picture, this, this little bit brighter ball here is, is the, 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 cold, uh, the cold atomic ensemble. So you can reach temperature between 10 and 100 microkelvin, I would say, with this, um, this technique, which is sufficient for, for uh, the kind of experiment we want to do. The other uh, system that has been uh, uh, considered this last years for ensemble-based quantum memories is based on, 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 on rare earth doped solids. So this is basically um, a piece of crystal doped with rare earth ions inside. And the rare earth ions, they basically behave as as atoms, it's ac probably as close as we can get uh, from atomic physics, but in a solid state. And um, they have the very nice advantage that they don't move. Basically, they are stuck in the crystal, so you don't need any, any, any fancy technique to, to, to trap them or to, um, to keep them in place. And as we will see, they also have actually very good uh, coherence time. So now we have the physical medium. Uh, now we can see what are, how we can really store now some light inside this system. Um, there are actually many protocols that have been proposed. Uh, I will not go through all of these. Um, some Raman protocols, um, called the DLCZ protocol, EIT, uh, photon echo base protocol, um, gradient echo memory, atomic frequency comp. I will not go through all of this. I will concentrate on this talk on two protocols that um, that have that are particularly important for quantum repeater applications. Uh, the first one is this so-called DLCZ. Um, I, I will come back to this in a minute. And the second one is, is the um, atomic frequency comp. Okay. So now I will come to the second part of the talk, which is basically to see what we can do uh, for quantum repeaters using these um, repeaters based on atomic ensembles and, and, uh, and uh, linear optics. So I'll start by the DLCZ protocol. So DLCZ stands for uh, Duan, Lukin, Sirac, and Zoller, uh, who have proposed this, this protocol in, uh, in 2001. This is actually a very important proposal. It was the first, let's say, practical architecture for making a quantum repeater. 
and it triggered a lot of, of, of uh, subsequent work, both from a, from a theoretical point of view and, and, and from an experimental point of view. So in that sense, it's a, it's a very, influential, uh, very influential proposal. So the idea here is that we use as quantum memory atomic ensembles, atomic gases, and it, it is based on the creation of this single collective spin excitations in, in the laser-cooled uh, gas using classical pulses. So this is a kind of read memory that I, that I, I introduced before. So, now the sp so you will basically excite your atomic ensemble with a laser pulse. It will emit the photon. And now this photon here will be uh, non-classically correlated or, or entangled with the uh, spin excitations with that you define like this, where S now is another, uh, another spin state uh, in, in the ensemble. And then you can really read out very efficiently uh, this spin excitation to onto, uh, onto, another, onto another photon. So this is basically what you have here is a correlated photon pair source, but with an embedded memory. So you can choose when you want to remit the second photon. And this will be the, basically the, the, the building block of the, of the DLCZ quantum, quantum repeater. So I, I, I will spend a little bit more time to explain a bit more in detail how, how this efficient retrieval works and then how we can do that with this collective spin excitation. Because actually this is, this is the basis of, of all the, 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 um, uh, the, this effect that we call collective enhancement is the basis of all the, 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 the memories based on atomic ensemble. So it's quite important to, to understand that uh, that way. So we, have, we start with the lambda system like this. Um, and at the beginning, all the atoms are, are in G. Now we send a, a laser pulse that we call the right pulse, which is slightly detuned from the excited state. And this laser pulse now will, um, from time to time, emit a photon on, on this transition here that we call the Stokes photon. So there will be photon emitted in four pi, and they will be emitted or, or in all directions. But we concentrate on one particular direction. We, we collect one uh, special mode uh, with an optical fiber of our, uh, from our system. And if we now detect a Stokes photon here, this will project the atomic ensemble into a state uh, like this, into one of these collective spin excitations, where you have all the atoms in G, but one in S, but where the excitation is delocalized over, over all the atoms. And you have a phase factor here, which depends on, on the wave vector of the, the right photon, of the right pulse, sorry, and of the Stokes photon. KW is the, the, the right pulse, and KS is the Stokes pulse. So now, this collective spin excitation can live there for as long as the, the coherence of the system allows. Uh, we will see uh, later that this can be actually quite, quite long. And now, after this time, what you can do is to read out the photon. So for this, you come with a read pulse now, which is now resonant with the S to E transition, uh, which, which can come, for example, in a counter-propagating uh, fashion. And then, this photon here, anti-Stokes, will be readmitted. So if you now compute the, 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 if you now write down, let's say, the state of, of the atom after the re-emission, you will see that if the atom come back to G, emitting a photon, an anti-Stokes photon here, then you, you have this other phase term here that, that, uh, that adds up. And basically what you can have is a kind of phase matching process that will now favor uh, the emission onto this particular, this particular mode. So it's easy to, to see if you, if you look, for example, let's imagine that the atoms are at rest, the atoms don't move. So between the right and the read pulse, the atoms are in the same positions. So what you have is, if you have now k right plus k read is equal to k stokes plus k anti-stokes, which is basically the situation here. So we just have counter-propagating uh, modes for, for everybody. Then this term here is, is equal to, to, to one. And then you, you sum from one to n, so you have an enhancement of the um, probability amplitude by a factor of n of emitting the photon in, what, in this particular direction. So it's like really you have a collective interference between all, all the atoms inside, which re-emit now the photon in one, one particular direction. And this, by the way, can also work if you, the atoms are moving. Uh, but in this case, what you need to have is that k right is equal to k stoke. So you need to have a collinear configuration which uh, for practical reasons uh, is a bit more difficult to, to handle uh, because you need to, 
filter now the photon of these right pulse, which is, contains many thousands of photons, and the Stokes beam here has only, only one photon in principle. Okay, so this, um, this has been uh, done for the first time in 2003 in uh, Jeff Kimball's group at, uh, in Caltech. And since then, there have been many, many groups working on that. I will not through, go through all of this. I will just uh, tell you a little bit what is the state of the art uh, on, on along these this, this, this memories. Um, the storage time that people could reach for the, the collective single, uh, single spin excitation now in the, in the spin state has been shown to be around 100 millisecond, um, uh, which is actually so far the longest uh, quantum memory that has been uh, demo demonstrated. Um, but the retrieval efficiency was actually a bit low in that, in that experiment. So this was done in, in, in uh, Alex Kutzmich group uh, at Georgia Tech at the time. And a bit more recently, there was another experiment uh, in, in Jan Wei Pai's group in, uh, in, in China, where here they combine now very high readout efficiency, uh, close, to, uh, close to 80%, and storage time for a millisecond or so. So we are not 100 millisecond, but we have kind of milli, a few millisecond storage time. So for this, they, they place the atom inside a, inside a cavity. Uh, it's not a high finesse cavity. It's a very low finesse cavity, actually. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not too difficult to, 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 to implement. OK, so now we have the building block. We have the, 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 the let's say, the, the quantum memory and the source embedded. So now the question is, how can we entangle two uh, uh, quantum memories which are far away? So the, 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 the process that um, uh, DLCZ proposed is to use a measurement um, where we can have entanglement at a distance by using the, the by a measurement. So what you, what you do is you have your two memories here, you excite them with the right pulse, and you collect some Stokes photon, you put them in the fiber, and you do this from, from two ensemble, and then you put the bin splitter at the middle where you have a click now. Uh, and if you have, if you have a click, uh, basically, this will project the two atoms in a state where you, where you have one excitation stored here and zero stored uh, in the other ensemble in coherent superposition with the, 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 other, way, the other way around. So this is an entangled state. Uh, it's a, it's a called a number state, number uh, state, uh, entangled state. It's heralded because we, we know when we have a click here, we know that the entangled state is there in the memory. And um, so basically, what the role of, of, of the beam splitter here in, in the middle is basically to erase the information about the origin of the photon. So we don't know from, if we detect a photon here, we don't know if it came from this ensemble uh, or from this ensemble. Uh, so by the rule of quantum mechanics, it had to came from, from both and to from superposition of both. And so you have, you have an, uh, uh, an entangled state like this. This phase here, this phase uh, phi here, um, is actually the phase which is acquired uh, the phase at the ensemble from the two laser pulse plus the phase acquired on the way uh, by, the, by the Stokes photon. So for doing this, in principle, you would have to stabilize uh, the, the phase um, on, 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 the, on the whole distance. Uh, this experiment actually has been, uh, has been done already quite some time ago, uh, actually 10 years ago, um, also in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Jeff Kimball's group. So what we, what we had is two atomic ensembles in two vacuum chamber separated by uh, around three meters. And um, we, we could create now an entangled state between these two, um, uh, these two ensembles. So the two conditions to have some entanglement uh, like this is that you have to be in the single excitation regime, such that you, you, the probability to create more than one pair is very small. And then you need to have coherent superposition between the two, um, the two ensembles. And this is something that we, uh, we verified as well. So we could really have one, one quantum of excitation, which was delocalized now between these two ensembles, three meters apart. So three meters is still not uh, very long, at least for quantum distribution standard. Um, but yeah, that's the first, that's the first step. So now, okay, we have the ele elementary link, let's say, of our repeaters. So now we can move on to do the, 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 the swapping. So the swapping is done in this way. So you have the first link here, the second link here, 
Um, oh. Sorry, the second link here. Um, and what you have now, what, you will, what we will do is to read out this memory B and C um, and, and take the, 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 the anti-Stokes photon and combine them also here at the, at the brain splitter. So basically, uh, this is also, it, it's, a, it's a kind of, of bell state measurement. Um, it's based on linear optics. So the efficiency of this measurement will be at most, at most one half. So we have some states where, which will not give any result, for example. Uh, we have also some states, um, so this will be the, the initial state that we, that we have. And after the, after the, the, the click, you would have uh, a state like this, which will be now, uh, now created. Um, actually, you have a mixture of this state and, and the vacuum state. You can have some measurement, for example, where you, where you have one photon is here and one photon is here. So you will detect only one, maybe only one here, but uh, there is nothing, there is the vacuum on the, on the two sides. So there is a part of vacuum which is, um, which is included here, uh, but this will be at the end of the, of the repeater. We could filter this using post-selection. Post so this is not a major, major problem. Uh, this experiment, by the way, has never been uh, achieved. Uh, there was some attempt also in, uh, in, in, uh, in Jeff Kimball's group, but at the time, the performance of the memories were not good enough to really do this step, uh, this, this first um, swapping step, let's say. So this is something that has so far never been, uh, never been achieved. And now I will just um, finish this, this, this part, this, this DLC that repeater, um, just by explaining you that what we have done so far is to have some, this number state entanglement in, uh, in over the chain. But number state entanglement, this kind of entanglement which is zero, one plus one zero, it's not very practical for doing, uh, uh, for example, quantum key distribution or violating Bell inequalities. Uh, first of all, because you need to have a, a phase reference to, to, to distribute a phase reference. And, and the second point is that it's actually difficult to make um, measurement in, in, in the superposition basis between zero and one. So the solution that DLCZ proposed uh, is actually to have two uh, chains uh, in parallel. So you create one first chain here, you create a second chain here, and um, so you have a state like this on, on the first chain, an entangled state between this one and this one, an entangled state between A2 and, and Z2. And then you just read out these two uh, here, and you combine at the bin splitter. And if you do this, and then you post-select on only the case where you have one excitation here on the, on the left and one here on the right, you can have a kind of effective state which looks like this, which is now basically um, you, you have an excitation here and, and, uh, and, and, and here plus the other way around. And uh, this now is equivalent, let's say, to a kind of polarization and tangle state where it's now easy to make measurements uh, on different bases to evaluate better inequality and, uh, and so on. And this is actually also a measurement that we, that we did um, using now this four atomic ensemble in, in, two, uh, in two separate vacuum chambers where we could now uh, really create an elementary link of a quantum repeater and, and show that we have some uh, um, violation of, of Bell inequality. Actually, a similar experiment has also been done in, uh, in John Way Pan's group. So here, they didn't use four ensemble. They just used two uh, ensembles, but they connect, do the entanglement swapping with uh, detecting two photons. So in the end, the result is, uh, is, uh, is, is quite similar. Okay, so I told you before that we succeeded in entangling two ensemble uh, over three meters. Uh, so of course three meters is not so long. So the question is how can we improve that? Um, well, actually one of the problem is that we use um, um, cesium, but many also, also we can use rubidium or cesium. So typically for rubidium, the wavelength is at 780 nanometer. Right? So if you want to put a photon like this in an optical fiber, the loss that you have is something like three dB per kilometer. So after 10, kilometer, 10 kilometers, you lose a factor of 1,000. So of course, uh, this is not very uh, good for doing really long distance. So what we can do uh, is actually to try to do some quantum frequency conversion. So to take this photon and at 780 and convert it to uh, 1550. Uh, so you would have like uh, here on the way, uh, 
to quantum frequency converter, and you need to do that in a way that preserves, of course, the quantum superposition, the quantum, uh, quantum entanglement. Um, there were several experiments. Actually, there were two experiments, not, uh, not that many, uh, that did this. The first one uh, was done here uh, by in, the, in Kutzmich group, uh, where they did this conversion um, using four-wave mixing in a, in a ultra-dense um, atomic uh, ensemble. So they have a different ensemble to do the conversion. Um, and we are also working on that in our group, but we use a different approach. Uh, so our approach is to uh, try to use an integrated waveguide to do this, this conversion. So we use an integrated PPLN waveguide to do, to do the conversion. So I will um, explain to you how it works. So we basically have a, uh, a waveguide, a PPLN waveguide, and we have a photon here that comes at 780 nanometer that we, that we um, uh, put at the input, and we have a very strong pump, which is at 1570 nanometer. And now by different frequency generation, what will happen is that um, this photon at 780 will be now transferred at, at 1550 nanometer. And now, we, so we could do that. Of course, one big issue here is that there is a lot of noise which is induced by this, this pump here at, at 1570 nanometer. So we need to uh, have actually some very narrow band filter to be able to, to, uh, to filter this noise. But it's not a problem because the photon that we generate is, is, is actually very long. It's something like um, a, few, a few tens of nanoseconds. So the bandwidth is actually very narrow. So we can put narrow band filters to, to, to filter. And so then we, as a proof of principle, what we do is we use uh, our DLCZ ensemble um, as a source of heralded single photons. Uh, so we detect here the Stokes photon. We send the right pulse. We detect the Stokes photon. Then we send the read. And we have here a heralded single photon which arrive now in front of the waveguide with a probability, conditional probability of about 25%. So if we have a click here on the Stokes, uh, if you have a click here on, on this Stokes detector that you detect now with the silicon APD, um, you will basically have 25% of chance to have a photon here at the input of the waveguide. And then we convert this and we detect at the, at the outputs with an ingas uh, APD. And what we could show is that we, using this, we could suppress the noise uh, sufficiently to be able to preserve now uh, non-classical correlations between the two, the right and the, and, and, um, the Stokes and, and the converted uh, anti-Stokes photon. So what you see here is the, um, uh, the cross correlation between the Stokes and anti-Stokes photon um, as a function of the probability, excitation probability, if you want. So as, as, far as, as long as we are higher than two, we are in a non-classical regime. So this, this data show that we are actually uh, strongly in the non-classical regime. And it's degraded, the, the, the non-classicality is degraded only because of the remaining pump noise that we cannot uh, not filter. And the process is actually quite efficient. So internally, we, we have a, a conversion efficiency of about 78, 76%. Um, the problem is that if you take now this as a device, uh, it, the efficiency goes down because you have to uh, couple the photon in the waveguide, you have loss in the waveguide, uh, you have loss on the filter afterwards. So the efficiency goes down to something like 15% if you take it as a, as a, as a, like a device efficiency. Um, okay, so that's actually one way of um, creating long distance entanglement between two, uh, two memories. I will show you here another way uh, that we can use using the, uh, the other kind of, of, of memory that I, that I explained, which are now these um, um, so, so-called absorptive or read-write memory. So here the, the scheme is the, is the following. You would have two sources of, um, um, of entangled state which create now two photons. One will be resonant with the memory, the other one will be, uh, could be a telecom wavelength in principle. You do the same here. And then you pump the two sources coherently. And then you uh, do the same trick as before. You take the two telecom photons, you put them, uh, mix them at the beam splitter in the middle. And basically you have exactly the same, the same thing. So your initial state will be something like this, a coherent superposition of a pair here and a pair here. And the conditional state, will now uh, 
actually also be an entangled state between this memory here and, and, and this memory here. So this is very similar actually to the, to the DLCZ uh, protocol. It's, it's um, um, actually, it's actually the, the, the same, except that now we separate the entanglement creation and, and, the, and, and the memory. And so now we can play this trick in principle to have one photon at one memory and, and, and another photon at, at, at another, um, at an, uh, one photon at one wavelength, sorry, and another photon at another, another wavelength. Um, so here, basically I show a, a, a piece of crystal. Um, this is to um, sort of prefigure the next slides. Um, we can use some kind of solid state memory here. We can use also other, other memories. Most of the experiments that have been done so far in this configuration have used solid state memories. So I will uh, just explain a bit how, how the solid state memory, uh, how the state, solid state memory works. So what has been proposed is to use rare earth ion doped crystals, um, which is basically, as I said before, it's a piece of crystal doped with uh, rare earth ions inside. The crystal is transparent, and so they're only the rare earth ions are doped, um, uh, let's say, randomly inside. And so you will, basically, they will uh, just absorb the light. So the light, if there is no, uh, no ions, the light is, is passing through. Uh, and, and if there is some ions, they will be absorbed by, uh, by this. So they, it's actually very nice for this kind of applications because they also have um, um, optical transition, they have spin transitions, and they are, so they are stationary, so you don't need to, to, to trap them more. They have actually excellent coherence properties. Um, we are talking about optical coherence here um, between a few hundred microseconds to uh, one millisecond, or it could be even more. This goes a bit too fast. Um, and spin coherence time that can reach uh, some uh, seconds, minutes, and even hours. And the nice point is that they have um, a, what we call a static inhomogeneous broadening. Inhomogeneous broadening means that each ion sees a slightly different environment in the, uh, in the crystal. And so it will have a slightly different resonance frequency. Um, but the nice point is that this is now fixed. It's not like Doppler broadening where you have collisions that change all the time. The, the, the broadening is, the inhomogeneous broadening is fixed. So this means that also that we can start to carve some, uh, some uh, shape into this uh, inhomogeneous uh, broadening, for example. So we can tailor the, the absorption in the crystal. And this will be, this will be very important. So there are several candidates that have been proposed and used as quantum memories, neodymium, erbium, europium, praseodymium, and, and, and tulium. Um, in our group, we chose uh, the praseodymium dope memory. Um, actually, we chose it uh, for the reason that so far, it's the material which gave the best uh, properties for the storage of classical light. Um, for example, there have been some experiments where people have stored uh, classical light uh, for more than one minute, for example, or a few seconds, like 10 years ago, and it was uh, increased to one minute uh, some uh, two years ago in the group of Thomas Hoffmann in Germany. Um, there have been some experiments um, in the group of Matt Sellers in Australia where uh, they have been able to store weak coherence state with an efficiency, a storage and retrieval efficiency of, of 70%. So this is basically um, kind of promising that we can try to use this material to now push this to, toward the quantum regime uh, to try to get this, this kind of figure of merit also for single photons. Um, it's by far not uh, easy to, to, to go from the classical to the, to, the, to the quantum regime, but at least there is, there is some, some hope. So this is the level structure of, the, of this crystal. We have three ground states and, and, and three excited states and an optical transition uh, at the frequency of uh, a wavelength of 606 nanometer. So the advantage of this crystal here is that it has quite long spin coherence time, um, uh, around, a, around a second. Um, it's not the longest. There is, uh, for example, this europium dope crystal here has even longer uh, coherence time, which can be some minutes. Um, but europium has a lower oscillator strength, let's say, so it has, it's not as easy 
to, um, to have high absorption. So this protodymium crystal has a, is a good trade-off between um, storage time and, and good absorption. And it has actually the good level structure to store light in, in the spin state. It's important to be able to have some spin state available to store the, store the quantum light. So the drawback is that the bandwidth is actually quite small. So it's limited by this spacing here between the, the, the levels. It's very limited to about four megahertz. So it's actually quite challenging to have a source which can go to that narrow, narrow, narrow band. And of course, the wavelength is not very friendly, uh, at least for telecom applications. So I think here the loss in, in the fiber for this must be probably eight or, or 10 dB per kilometer. So it's, uh, you cannot really directly use this for long distance um, communication. But we don't need actually to use this for, for to, to send this photon uh, far away. No? So we, what, what we want to do is this trick where we have one photon resonant with the memory and the other photon uh, at telecom wavelength. So we have actually did, uh, we did this uh, experiment, this source. So the challenge here is that you cannot, you could use just parametric down conversion as a source because it's, it's something which is very flexible. You can have photons at many different wavelengths that you want. You can choose basically your wavelength. Uh, but parametric down conversion creates photons with a bandwidth typically of 100 gigahertz or, or, or one terahertz, so very large. So what we did to overcome this is we put the crystal inside an optical cavity um, and we generate so one photon at, at 606 to be resonant with the prosodymium memory and the other photon at 1436. Um, so the memory has to be, the, the cavity, sorry, has to be um, resonant with both these wavelengths if you want to have this cavity enhancement. And if you have the cavity enhancement, basically what you will enhance is the probability to generate a pair within the cavity mode. So the cavity mode for us is given by uh, two or three megahertz. So in the end, we can create photons with a reasonable pair rate uh, with about this, this wavelength. With, again, one photon memory resonant and the other at telecom. So there are actually other work uh, that has been done by different groups using different techniques. Uh, Geneva, Calgary, and um, actually more recently there was some uh, nice work in Erlangen where they use, instead of using this kind of, of bulk um, cavity, they, they use some kind of a small micro cavity, which is an interesting uh, development. Um, okay, so this now gives uh, how we can build a source. Uh, now let's see how we can use this, the, the, this crystal, this rare adobe crystal to, 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 store, um, uh, to store quantum light. So I will explain now how the quantum memory, how the, the atomic frequency com memory works. So basically, in these rare adobe crystals, you have inhomogeneous broadening. So the excited state is inhomogeneously broadened. If you come here with a photon and you absorb it here, you, your collective excitation will quickly deface and you will lose the, the, the information. But what we can do to compensate this dephasing is to now tailor the absorption profile of, of your crystal in, in some sort of what we call atomic frequency comp. So it's a, a series of periodic uh, absorption peak. You can see better here. So this would be the optical depth now as, as a function of frequency. So you have a series of very narrow periodic absor absorbing peaks. Um, and if you do that, now you send your photon, um, your photon, sorry, you send your photon in. So the spectrum of the photon uh, must be actually larger than, than, the, than the separation between two teeth, but smaller than the, the whole atomic frequency comb. And if you do this, now you will convert, right after the mapping, you will have one of these collective excitation, again, optical excitation now, so we are, we are we have um, one atom excited in the excited state. Um, and now you, would, you will still have the dephasing, right? Because you, the, the inhomogeneous broadening is still, is still there. But the nice point here is that because it's periodic, um, at some point there will be a rephasing. And what happens is that uh, the, 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 the ions start to, to, to dephase, and then some atoms which are in the first, um, first peak Let's say we'll do one turn on the, on the block sphere. Some atoms which are the second peak will do two turns on the block sphere and then they will, at the end, they, they will just um, uh, meet together after this time, uh, after a time which is one over, one over delta here. 
And then when they meet together, when they are in phase again, the light will be re-emitted now in the, in the forward direction. So this is basically, it's a, co it's a coherent effect, it's a collective effect. It, it resembles what we could have with the kind of photon echo uh, emission. Uh, but very important here to note that it, it is completely noise free in the sense that when we send the photon in, there is no other pulse, light pulse that comes in for now. So this protocol is in principle, um, uh, is good for, for sto storing single photon. You can store, you can do good, uh, go in the quantum regime with this. And I will come back also to this later, but the reason why we, uh, we are interested in this protocol is that it allows uh, to, to do multi-mode storage, to store not only one temporal mode, but many, many temporal modes. Um, so this has been used actually in, in, uh, in several experiments to now store this entanglement, to create now entanglement between a telecom photon and, and, uh, and a crystal. Um, uh, in 2011, there were these two experiments uh, in Geneva, in, uh, in Nicolas Zidane's group, and, uh, and, and in Wolfgang Kittel's group in Calgary. Um, using here neodymium crystal and, and, and tulium. Uh, this uh, was done actually for a very short storage time, a few hundred nanoseconds, um, and in, in a system which was not, not compatible with, um, with extension of this scheme where we can go to the, to the ground state. So we actually also did in Barcelona this, uh, this experiment where we could extend now the storage time um, uh, up to five microseconds still in the excited state, uh, using our, our cavity and, and the protodymium uh, dope memory. But so far, it's, well, we have storage in the excited state. Um, this is a, a problem because the um, coherence time of the excited state is actually not infinite. It's not very, it can be maybe a few hundred um, uh, microseconds, but it cannot be much longer than, than this. The other problem is that with this atomic frequency comp, if you just store in the excited state, you cannot choose the readout time of your, of your memory. So you have a, a, a predetermined uh, readout time. You store the photon in and it's like passively remitted after a time that you cannot choose directly when the photon is inside. So you, you could not use then this kind of memory as, as a, a tool for synchronization of the different parts of, of the network. But what you can do uh, is actually to, if you have another spin state, which is the case for our protodymium uh, memory, for example, you can take now a strong control pulse and, and take this collective excitation and transfer it as a spin excitation now between these two spin states here. And well, now if it's, uh, sorry, it's a bit too fast. If it's in the spin excitation, then the coherence time can be much longer in principle. Um, we could access now, in principle, uh, this, this minute storage time that we, that we saw before. We are not there yet. Um, and then you, uh, after the storage time, you send another control pulse to put it back now in the excited state, and then the photon will be remitted now on, on, this, on this transition here. So this gives you the on-demand readout. Now, when you want to read out the memory you just push on the button that emits the second laser pulse here, and you have the undermine readout, and this gives you a longer storage time. This has been demonstrated in, in 2010, uh, here in this, in this paper, with bright pulses. Um, so what we would like to do, of course, is to go to single photon level. Um, but actually, it's, it, it's quite challenging to do that, and the reason is that now this uh, control pulse here, they have maybe, uh, a few billion photons inside, and they are very close in, in, in frequency, and you have a single photon here on this transition, right? So this photon will create some kind of technical noise that we need to, um, to filter somehow. So this has been actually difficult for quite some time, but we recently succeeded, actually uh, in also in, in, um, in parallel with, uh, with a group in, in, in Geneva, to really uh, go now to the single photon level uh, stored uh, in, the, in, the, in the solid state memory. So what you see here is the, the kind of input pulses, and then you, you have the two control pulse, so this, it's not the same scale, but uh, at least vertically. Um, and then what you have here is, if you don't have any input, input photon, you have this kind of noise. If you have an average 
uh, 1.2 photon per pulse, restoring now weak coherent state. This is the kind of signal that you, that you see. So, and you can, if you go down to 0 0.6 and so on, you can still see something even with very low number of photons. So the efficiency here is still not very high, um, um, around, around 3% or so. But the good point is that we can have at single photon level a very good signal to noise ratio and this is what is important for at least to continue this uh, along, along this, this path. Okay, so this was a little bit of a um, detour, let's say, on, on, on quantum memories and, and, and so on. Um, let's come back to the point, uh, which is hopefully we would like to build uh, some kind of quantum repeater. Um, so this figure here is a little bit disappointing. Uh, what we show is basically the time to distribute an entangled pair uh, as a function of distance, um, assuming 90% memory readout efficiency, which is maybe not completely crazy. We have, there are some memories which, are, which works with close to this to, to this. Um, optimal wavelength, 1550, which we could also do in principle. And what you have, see, what you have here is a direct transmission. And so this is the same line I show you, showed you in the, in the the beginning, at the beginning of the talk. And this line here is, uh, is the DLCZ protocol, um, which actually so far is what we could obtain if we just build up and scale up, let's say, uh, what, I, what I have shown you so far. So the good news is that after a few hundred kilometers is much better than, uh, than direct transmission. Uh, but the bad news is that if you look at the, the time here, it's, uh, it's actually quite long. So we are talking about something like a thousand seconds for um, uh, for a thousand kilometer. Yeah, we could, could try to do something, but it would still not very be st still not be very practical. Um, one thing that I haven't told so far is that if you want to build a repeater like this, something which is very important uh, is that the memory time, the storage time of your memory must be typically much longer than the total time it takes to distribute the entangled pair. So, okay, that's quite long also as a storage time. So is it even doable? Um, well, let's see. What the longest quantum memory that has been demonstrated yet uh, is actually this, this Kutzmich memory that I, that I told you about. So the storage time is 100 milliseconds. So definitely we are not there yet, but it's, um, it's, it's already a very, uh, very good result. But there are some hope to go a little bit longer. For example, in this prosodymium doped crystal, they could reach one minute with um, classical light and using very sophisticated dynamical decoupling techniques. And so it's not clear yet that this will work at the quantum regime. This is something that we are working on. But this is clearly uh, a, a challenge to pass from the classical to the, to the quantum regime. Okay, you could have one minute. It's a bit better, but maybe it's not yet sufficient. Um, but there is some more hope, actually. So this, there was this experiment uh, that has been done in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Matt Seller's group in, in Australia, where they use a europium dope crystal. So it's the same kind of crystal, it's just a different dopant. Um, they also have an optical transition, so they can be optically addressed. And Basically here, they could demonstrate a spin coherence in, in the crystal of more than six hours. So now this starts to be interesting. So they are, there, is, there is no light storage yet, not even classical, but in principle, they could, they, they could do. But we just demonstrated the spin coherence. So we, in principle, there is, it's not completely crazy, let's say, to think that there could be one day a, a quantum memory that can, uh, can store quantum information for, for, for a few hours. So this, let's say, gives some hope on, 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 this, on this point. Okay, but still, it's, uh, it's actually not very, um, uh, it's actually not, let's say, not very good to, to um, uh, the, the time, the, the kind of, of, uh, of um, time that we can reach. And so there are, there are different limitations. Um, one of the limitations is that you have this probabili probabilistic light matter entanglement. Um, the other limitation that we have, which is 
actually common to all the, the repeaters based on a heraldic entanglement is that you have this communication time latency, so you have to wait until you have the result uh, of the entanglement to start again. And the last point is that we have some probabilistic um, um, bell state measurement. So now let's see how we can try to improve, Im Im improve this. So the first point, the problem is that the state that you generate either with down conversion sources or uh, with um, DLCZ quantum memories is, 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 is this one. So we have a state where you have most of the time you have the vacuum with a very small probability you have you generate a, a pair of photons and then we, you have some higher order terms as well. So here, the problem is that if you now want to, you would like, naively you say, okay, I increase this P, right? So you, I generate more photon pairs, I can just increase the P. But unfortunately, this doesn't work because if you increase the P, what you will do is decrease the correlation between the photon. You will start to generate more and more uh, uh, double pairs and so on, and you will decrease the other correlation. So this is now the second order cross correlation between the two photons, um, and it scales as one over P, basically. So if you, if you pump harder, you decrease the correlation. And this is a problem because at the end, the fidelity of your entanglement scales as, as typically G2 over G2 plus one here. So if you increase the probability, you decrease the fidelity. So you really have this trade-off, and this is, uh, this is, this is, a, this is a problem, one, of the, one of the problems. Um, one way we could get around this is to forget about probabilistic sources and, and go to deterministic sources. So now it's not easy, of course, to build a, 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 a source of entangled photon pairs which are memory compatible, which can work on demand, but maybe some intermediate step we could have is to have a single photon source that can that can that could do the job for us. So if you, what we could have is have two single photon sources, a bin splitter, and we take part of this light stored in this memory, and part is, is transmitted here over a long distance, and then we can use the same the same trick as before. And in the end, we could also have a kind of entangled state, uh, conditioned on this click here, with some vacuum inside, but we could again be post-selected. This would be already a little bit a little bit better. So if I, this was what I showed before, um, this new protocol based on single photon source would be, would be here. Um, so it's already some, uh, something better. We can even do a little bit better if we use more and more complex um, a scheme where we create locally um, some, uh, um, let's say, deterministic pairs of entangled photons using many ensembles. Uh, it's a bit more complex, but in, in principle, it could, you could, could be a bit better. So now we are talking about a few, maybe 10 seconds over a 1,000 kilometers, so it's already, already quite better. But well, it's still quite slow, so let's see if we can do uh, even better. Um, the thing is, if you are able now to have a memory that can store not only one mode, but many modes, so mainly, basically we want to do some multiplexing. If you can do this multiplexing, um, you can basically increase the rate of uh, generating entanglement in the first link by a factor of n. So just if you have 100 modes, if you're able to have 100 modes, you could, you could go down there here. If you go to 1,000 modes, you could even go lower, um, and so on. So this actually is a very interesting path, and uh, I want to uh, explain you a bit more uh, in detail how it works. Okay, so this is the problem. The problem is the, 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 the communication time. So we have, if we have a conventional memory, we have this kind of scheme. We want to do entanglement, so we have to wait until the photon is come from here, goes at the center, and then we have to wait for the classical signal to come from the center and come, come back here. So of course, uh, this, um, um, this is quite long. If you have, let's say, two memories distant by 100 kilometers, this would take 500 microseconds. So the basic rate of the repeater uh, would actually go down by, 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 uh, by quite a lot. Uh, it would be something like two kilohertz, which, which is very, very small. And then the success probability, if you use at least probabilistic sources, is typically low on, on, on the range of 10 to the three and 10 to the four, because also the photon has to travel from here to, to here. So this is a, a strong limitation. But now if you have memory that can store many, many modes here, you can speed up this by, by, by the factor of n. 
Um, and yeah, in principle, uh, we will see, but many, it's possible to store, in principle, many, many different modes. And for this, the memory needs to be ab able to store um, n distinguishable mode, uh, put temporarily here, but it could be also other kind of modes. You need to be able to read out uh, the phase, uh, the, the, the selectively, the, the, the stored mode, and it needs, to, of course, to preserve the, the, the phase. So now the swapping is done in, 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 in this way. Let's imagine that on this uh, link here, you have entanglement uh, in the mode M. On this link, you have entanglement on the mode N. Then to do the swapping, you basically need to uh, match these two modes. So that's why you need to have the selective readout um, to be able to superpose now the two modes on, on, on the bin splitter to do, to do the swapping. Um, so there are different ways to do, uh, to do this. One is to do temporal multiplexing. And for this, actually, the atomic frequency COM protocol that I propose is, is a very, it's very good in, in that sense. Because if you have one mode at the output, you have another mode. But if you now put many modes at the input, you can also store these many temporal modes and read them out also the many temporal modes. And basically, you can show that the number of modes that you can store is proportional to the number of peaks that you have in your atomic, uh, atomic frequency count. So this is one um, example uh, that, that we did in Geneva some years ago, um, where we could store up to 64 temporal modes uh, in, in, in the crystal, um, in a neodymium doped crystal uh, at this point. So this was done now in the excited state of, um, of, um, um, of the crystal. So in the excited state, it's actually easier because what you can do, if you have want to have more peaks in the comb, you can just add more. It's actually a bit more tricky if you want to do that in the, in, in for spin wave storage, for spin state storage, because then you start to have to be bounded by the, the um, separation between the ground state. So what you, you, can, you cannot have combs which are larger than this. So what you need to do is to have Basically, if you want to have more peaks, you need to, to have narrower peaks. So this is a bit more difficult, but it's also possible. Um, and in this particular crystal now in Geneva, they demonstrated up to five modes. Um, in Europium, in principle, 100 modes should be, should be, uh, should be doable even in, in the spin state. Um, OK, I will. I will, I will we can, I will speak, I will skip this. We can also do that in principle with um, um, Atomic Ensemble and, and the DLCZ. I uh, will just skip this because I start to be out of time. Um, there is another possibility of, of doing multiplexing, which will be to do spatial multiplexing. So here the idea would be um, to have just at each side, you would have many different uh, uh, memories. and. Typically, you would start to create entanglement within the elementary link. So this was proposed uh, by um, uh, in the Kennedy Group in 2007, and I, I borrowed this picture actually from from this paper, this paper here. Uh, you start to create entanglement now um, within each of each segment, um, and now if you have a success here for this segment and success here, you do the Bell state measurement in between these uh, these two things here. And of course, something I have not mentioned uh, before is that using this, you can increase, you can decrease the time it takes to uh, to distribute a pair. But on, by the same amount, you can also relax the um, requirements on the, on the storage time of the quantum memory. So this is actually a very interesting path to go because you increase the rate and then you also decrease the um, the, the the storage time memory that you need. So they have, they, have, they have actually done an experiment in, the, in, in the Alex Kuzmich's group along these lines, where they have an atomic ensemble, and they could address, with uh, acoustic deflectors, they could address 10 different parts of the ensemble and have these 10 memories in the, in the same, uh, in the same uh, atomic gas. So here, they could, it's just a 1D, actually just 1D scanning, but in principle, you can also do a 2D scanning, and, and then these 10, uh, could become 100 as well. Um, and then the last possibility now to, um, 
to do this multiplexing uh, would be to use uh, frequency multiplexing. <coughs> so here the idea is um, you need to have an inhomogeneous system for this. Um, and basically, this could be done with a rare absorbed crystal where you create now different atomic frequency comb at different frequency. So this is what is done here. Oops, sorry. This is what is done here. So you can see they, they, they create many different combs. So you have here the optical depth as a function of frequency. Uh, they created many different combs at different frequency. Um, and they could store actually up to 26 uh, frequency bins with, an, with a fidelity of, um, of, uh, of 97%. So they could store time bin qubits in, in 26 different uh, frequencies. Um, and actually, I will skip this. They also have a, a scheme where you could, you could have, in principle, very, uh, let's say, if you have a lot of modes uh, and you have deterministic sources, uh, they also propose a, a, a scheme where you could, um, in principle, use this frequency multiplexing uh, as a resource to really now go to much higher rates. So this is, you need very, hard, very large bandwidth memory and, and so on. So this is a bit optimistic, but it shows that you could, in principle, reach um, much higher rates. We are here at 10 to the 4 per, per, per second. OK, but you need, if you want to reach this kind of things, you need very, very high number of modes. So let's, let's see a bit what we could do. This would be the dream multimode quantum memory. We, we have several ways of multiplexing. Let's see what we could do if we put everything together. So 100 temporal modes. This is, uh, should be, in principle, uh, possible. Uh, we have, it has been demonstrated close to this in the excited state, but in the ground state, uh, it could still be, still be done. 100 frequency modes is, in principle, also possible. 100 spatial mode is, is not completely crazy also. So if we combine now these things together, uh, we are starting to have a, a really large number of modes. And actually, this would bring us in a regime where we would have s many um, uh, multiple successful entanglement generation per communication time. And it's a regime that has been not be very well studied now. It could be that then this kind of, um, of architecture that I showed you are not, not the best for, for, for this. So this is something that could be interesting to, to really uh, push forward a, um, a bit more. So there is, I think there is clearly some hope that using multiplexing, we can really um, increase a lot the, the, the rate of potential repeaters. OK, in the next uh, few minutes, uh, I will just address the last, um, uh, the last problem that I haven't, spoke, uh, I haven't spoken so far, is the fact that if you use linear optics for the Bell state measurement, uh, you need, um, let's, let's say, the, 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 the Bell state measurement will not be complete, will not be, um, will be uh, probabilistic, sorry with an efficiency of at most one half. Um, actually, using single emitters, you can go, go around this. Um, I briefly show that th there was so also some uh, architecture that have been proposed for single ions, for example. So you have a single ion sitting in a cavity uh, that is uh, emit entangled now with a photon. Um, and you, if you do here a bell state measurement in the middle, you can have entangled state between the two ions here. And you can do the same here. In principle, now you could do a deterministic Bell state measurement. And if you allow yourself this uh, kind of resource, uh, then this is what, what, you, what you would get. So this one here is, let's say, the, the best um, protocol on, on, um, uh, on atomic ensemble and, and uh, linear optics, uh, single mode protocol. And this is what you could get if you have now this ability to make deterministic Bell state measurement. So uh, this, by the way, this kind of similar kind of experiment, uh, not with ions, but has been done with NV centers, uh, separated by more than uh, one kilometer, where I think we will hear more about this um, uh, tomorrow. But this, this could go in this direction. But of course, you need the, to have this kind of rates. You need to have the ion sitting in a cavity or your NV center sitting in a cavity with a very efficient collection efficiency. This is not, uh, not done yet. Uh, I think I'm almost out of time. Yeah, I will just present this uh, experiment and this will be the last that I will, I will show. So along this direction, th there was actually a very um, 
impressive result reported recently by the group of uh, Chris Monroe, where they, they, typ they typically want to go in this uh, direction. So you have two ions uh, in two different traps, and in one of the trap you have uh, two ions sitting next to, next to, it, next to each other. And then they do some entanglement between the remote ions using this uh, measurement induced trick. Then they also, at the same time, um, perform now deterministic entanglement between the two ions close to, close to each other. So this really goes in the, in the, in the, the good direction. And the very important point of that experiment is that I think for the first time, probably, now they could create the entanglement in a time which is uh, shorter than the storage time of the memory. So in principle, they could start really to scale up and, and, uh, and, um, and do, the, do, the, do the next step. But of course, again here, the ions are, are not in a cavity, and uh, there are some first attempt to put ions in, uh, in, uh, in cavity in, uh, in uh, Tracy Northup and Heiner Blatt's group, but it's, yeah, so far it's, not, uh, it's, it's still quite, uh, quite difficult. Okay, I will finish now here, just, just a brief summary. Um, so I showed you two different systems, well actually more chemical ensemble than single atoms, but um, let's say the, uh, the nice point about atomic ensemble is that it's a kind of simple implementation. You don't, have, you don't need high finesse cavity. Um, and the other very good point is that you have the multiplexing capability. On the other hand, you have this problem that the, prob the entanglement is probabilistic, uh, which, is, uh, which is clearly a problem, and also that the Bell state measurement that you can do with linear optics are, are probabilistic. With single atoms, uh, you can have this deterministic light um, matter entanglement, in principle deterministic Bell state measurement, but you need cavities, and also the, the multiplexing capabilities are, are also limited. So this calls actually for, um, it would be nice to have some kind of hybrid system, right, where we could use ensemble for efficient generation over a single link, and then use um, single atom or Rydberg atoms, which is something that I haven't talked about, but it's also possible uh, to do the deterministic Bell state, uh, Bell state measurement. Okay, so I hope um, I could convey the fact that uh, distributing entanglement over very long distance is actually uh, a great challenge, um, partly because you need to combine different technologies together, and uh, this is not always so easy. I think our first goal, first interesting goal would be really to beat the direct transmission. So at this point, we are not talking about doing uh, full repeaters with uh, aeroporification and, and, and this. I think just being able to beat direct transmission would be a really uh, a, a very nice, nice goal. We are not there yet, uh, we are, um, but there are some hopes. This would be, of course, new opportunities for uh, quantum key distribution, but so I think on the way, there is some really interesting physics that, that we can do and we increase our uh, level of control between the, let's say, the light and, and, and the matter. And this will be interesting for other technologies. So let me just uh, thanks uh, so the uh, members of my group and also thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Um, so we have a little bit of time for, for questions. So thanks for this nice tutorial. Um, you mainly spoke about loss and the problem of loss and overcoming loss um, and only very briefly touched upon the topic of noise um, and fidelity decrease. Um, so you see the, I mean, you see this not as a problem at all in the first step to reach your first goal? Yeah, so, um, so I, thi I think clearly if you want to, to really go to, let's say, applications and, and have do QKD with very low uh, uh, qubit error rate, for example, this will, this will become a problem. So wh what I showed so far is indeed assuming that, let's say, the Bell state measurements are almost perfect and, and so on. Um, I would say at the first, really at the first goal, um, loss is the most difficult thing to, 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 to beat. We assume indeed that we can do um, the Bell state measurement in, in a, in a quite efficiently and that the entanglement is not degraded 
um, over um, over the, over the distance. So the links are still short enough, and we don't put so many links mm -hmm. so that the entanglement is not degraded. If we want to start to include error purification, for example, and and do um, then this will significantly um, um, uh, make the system more complicated. Complicate it will, si will si significantly complicate the system. There are indeed there are some. Um, proposal to do that, but indeed here I, I have not considered that. So, But it will, it will complicate the, the system for, for sure. But you, you stated sort of the first goal, be direct transmission, um, you know, with a repeater. Do you think you can reach this without yes, considering noise? Yes, I think to, to, go to, to beat direct transmission, I, I think we, we don't necessarily need to, 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 have, uh, to have error correction. To, to be able to have this purification. If we want to reach then fidelities of 99% over 1,000 kilometer, we would need to do that. But to beat a direct transmission with fidelities of about 90% or something on this range, I think we can do it without. Uh, So mm, you say that um, as regards the quantum uh, ensemble-based memories, uh, during the frequency conversion uh, to 780 nanometers uh, from 780 to 1500, um, what kind of noise do you have? Do you have any um, multi-photon components, for example, or is it just like an attonation of the probability of uh, getting something? So no, so we the, the only noise that we that we get is because we have this very strong pump, uh, telecom wavelength, which creates some Raman noise in, in the crystal. So it's actually a noise which is very broadband, um, and so that's a nice point because we can easily filter it with a, with a very narrow filter. So what we see, we don't change the statistics of the of the emitted photons. We just add some uh, some incoherent noise, but we can filter that quite uh, quite easily. Actually, we have some new data that I haven't shown where. We take a really narrow filter, something like 200 megahertz, and now we can really get this noise even uh, a factor of 10 down. So, it, for example, the, the noise so far, what we have seen is that um, the noise is inversely proportional to the bandwidth of, of, the, fi of the filter that we, that we see. So, in principle, it is, it's not a big problem to have this, this, this noise. I, you, you mentioned that for this um, for the multimode memory to uh, improve the distribution of entanglement, you would need the selective readout. And I didn't really understand how you would realize this in this AFC memory once the are in the spin state. Like so what this selective readout. Let's say by what, what I mean by selective readout here is that let's say you have uh, many modes stored in one memory, and you have let's say and many modes stored in the, in the other memory. And what you need to do is to um, and then take the two modes and, and store them and make re-emit them at the same time so that they can interact at the bin splitter for the bell state measurement. So well, how, you can, how you can do this is just by uh, read them out a bit later, for example. So you know when, you ha you know when the, en the entanglement has succeeded, and then you just calculate when you have to put your read pearls to, to read them out a little bit later to synchronize, synchronize the two. You would uh, read out all the whole train of pulse. It's not yes, a okay, temporal no, selective readout. In yeah, yeah okay, so exactly. So you read, you read out the whole train. Uh, what you could do if you want to not read out the whole train is to read out one part and then bring them back down to the spin state, for example. This could be a possibility. But so far, yeah, the most of the, 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 the regime that I was interested was more in the regime where you create less than um, one excitation in the total train, let's say. So then you can read out one particular excitation, but yeah, you cannot, um, so you cannot, you have to read out the, the, the whole train in principle, yes. Thank you, thank you for a nice talk. And uh, you gave a lot of figure in, in this presentation. And uh, in this figure, do you include the effect for the exponential decay for matter quantum memory as well? No. Um, okay, you assume the perfect memory. Yeah, yeah. For 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 the for, for the figure for the rates, uh, I assume that the memory is much longer 
than, than, the, ra than the total uh, time for distributing entanglement. Let's but I think that uh, this is unfair because uh, we have already included the uh, exponential loss for photons. It's, it, it of course, the matter quantum memory also has exponential decay. In order to perform the quantum beta, actually, we need to care everything about the exponential decay. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I, I agree that if you want to, to build a quantum repeater, you have to, to have this memory which is longer. So here what I showed is that you, you, can, uh, you can find tricks to decrease the total time. Uh, and this also relax now the, the, the requirements on the quantum memory. If you can use this multiplexing, for example, you can relax the requirement on the quantum memory. So if then it takes, um, uh, let's say, a millisecond to distribute a pair of a thousand kilometer, you don't need one hour storage time. You need maybe a second. And this starts to be more doable, I would say, in principle. But it's, it's, a, it's an important goal to push, of course, the, the, the storage time of the, the quantum memory to much longer than what we have now.